Good afternoon. Nice to see that you're all here. Uh, I'm Rainier, and I will be your interviewer of today. Imagine you've already started your career, and you have worked long enough to start saving money towards your retirement. Where will you look to invest your money in? Well, probably the answer would be in an institutional investment fund, such a firm such as uh, BlackRock or Vanguard. These firms follow the tactic of passive management, in which they invest your money in all sorts of different companies at the same time. The risks are very low and the fees are almost zero. These investment firms are a great invention. Everybody seems to love them. Our two guests today, however, have been leading a battle to show that these great, uh, this big investment fund mi firms might end up meaning higher banking and airline costs for you, your friends, and your family. The three biggest inve investment firms together are the dominant shareholder in the five, uh, the dominant shareholder in 88% of the large, uh, the 500 largest firms in uh, America, such as Apple and Facebook. Some argue that the unstoppable rise of these institutional investments may radically change the face of contemporary capitalism. What will the world look like when our economies are controlled by a few? We will discuss this topic today with two very interesting guests. To start with, Anna Tsanaki. She is currently a senior lecturer at Lund University in Sweden, where she teaches master students EU competition law and business law. She got her PhD degree at University College London, and uh, her research focuses on EU competition law. Secondly, uh, our second guest is Jose Azar. He currently is an assistant professor at um, the um, business school uh, in of the University of Navarra in Spain. He got his PhD and master's degree at the Princeton University in America, and he wrote some very exciting paper, uh, papers on the topic of common ownership. So please give them a warm round of applause. All right. Welcome. Thank Hi. you very much for being here again. All right. Thank you. When, uh, when researching on the internet uh, for the interview, I stumbled upon a photo of you, of you two taken together. Yes. Um, <laughs> how, did you, how did you meet each other? Um, I guess it's Wayne or Ella Fogel. Yeah. So, sorry. So, um, I was a visiting researcher at Harvard Law School mm -hmm. for a year and a half, working on this area mm -hmm. of research. Mm -hmm. So, it was part of my PhD, as it was part of the PhD dissertation of Jose. Uh, so my supervisor <coughs> at Harvard was uh, Einar Elhog, Professor Einar Elhog, mm -hmm. and he started noticing the research of Jose, so he started writing on this topic as well while I was undertaking my research as well. So when I contacted him and we started discussing, um, then he suggested that I uh, contact Jose because I had some questions about the economic assumptions of all these models that we need to look at and understand from a legal perspective in order to, n to see how we need to design or perhaps change our laws to what extent and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's first move to the audience for a moment to test their awareness uh, about the topic we're discussing today. So please raise your hand if before the interview you uh, had ever heard of the term common ownership. Okay, no. that's not so much. Uh, and then please raise your hand if you ever heard of the investment firms uh, Black, uh, BlackRock or Vanguard. Okay, that's, that's a lot more already. So um, let's see if, if everybody has a good understanding of how much assets these firms have under their, their management. So the biggest investment firm at the moment is BlackRock. So I'm going to give three options, and then you can raise your hand uh, at the second time I say them if you, um, w what you think is the correct answer. So do you think BlackRock has A, 60 billion uh, euros under their management, B, 600 billion, or C, 6 trillion 
euros under their management. So who thinks it is A, 60 billion? And who thinks it is B, 600 billion euros? Or C, 6 trillion euros? Okay, it's, it's kind of divided, but yeah, the correct answer, uh, perhaps you know it, is uh, 6 trillion euros. And to make this huge amount of money a bit, of bit more concrete to us students, 6 trillion euros equals approximately 1 trillion uh, Heineken six-packs, for example. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it also equals, for example, to the GDP of uh, countries as uh, Germany and the United Kingdom added up to each other. So over the past few years, the amount of passive investments uh, compared to active investments uh, has been growing and growing. So Mrs. Uh, Tanaki, could you shortly describe the difference between passive and active management? Yes, I mean, uh, it depends on what perspective you look at the issue. I mean, from a finance perspective, you know, active um, investment is, you know, when you really have to pick the stocks and make a portfolio mm -hmm. where, you know, you actively choose which firms you're yeah. going to include in your portfolio. Yeah, to outperform the market. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, now, after the 2008 crisis, mm -hmm. um, you know, the strategies, investment strategies changed. So we moved, especially in the U.S., we moved towards a passive, in passive investment uh, strategy model. So um, in this situation, uh, you build, a, you know, we have the index fund, so you build an index and you try to track the market. Instead of outperforming yeah. the market, you think, oh, perhaps I could just, you know, diversify uh, across the market and mm -hmm. uh, build the portfolio based on um, many firms uh, across uh, industries yeah. and also many firms across the same within the same industry. Yeah. So you make sure that you don't do something very wrong and you're yeah. safe, that you yeah. have uh, perhaps a stable investment and saving yeah. income yeah. out of that. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Mr. Azar, do you think uh, Mr. Tanaki just mentioned that it is a trend sort of started after the crisis. Do you think that the, the trend of, of going from, from active to passive really started at the crisis or, or was it already sort of going on before? Well, from, from the data that I've seen, I, I think it's been an ongoing trend for, for a long time and it's basically following the, you know, yeah, the idea that it's a good idea to invest passively for mm -hmm. most people uh, and not pick stocks and just get as much diversification as they can, you know, and this comes from standard modern portfolio theory, yeah. uh, you know, which was uh, studied by Harry Markowitz in the 50s, mm -hmm. and, uh, and from an investment point of view, you know, this is uh, fairly standard and, and I think more or less sound advice. Yeah. Um, uh, so if you're not really ex experienced, it's, it's probably the best thing to... Yeah, it, it, it might be, I mean, but you could argue that it is, and, uh, and I'm not arguing against that, yeah. you know. It's um, it's just that well now we're seeing what happens when everybody follows that. Yeah. And, and but, um, currently technology and algorithms are, are are really increasing and and perhaps the in the future they will be able to uh, predict these the, the behavior of the financial markets in a better way. So do you, Mr. Arsha, do you do you think that um, the the rise of this technology perhaps uh, will change the, the favor of, of passive over active to the contrary in the future? You mean if we have algorithms that are Yeah, that could that predict the market. Yeah. Uh, uh, and but can choose stocks actively? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on where the algorithms... Um, I don't know what the algorithms will do. You know, maybe they will choose something that's similar to an index. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe if they pick one stock per industry, then it would be very different. And, and then, yeah, we, we would have, um, you know, but this is all hypothetical. I mean, I, I yeah. have no idea what these algorithms okay. will look like. Yeah. So, um, oh, wait. Uh, yeah. So we talked a bit about the rise of, of passive investment over the, over the past years, and of course, these big investment firms have have profited from this this rise uh, mm -hmm. of, of passive investment. But, Mr. Tanaki, how did how did so few investment fund uh, firms became so big? Like because they were they're 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 not they're like with uh, only a few which are really really big, so how how is that? Uh, I mean, um, you know, this was a trend that started I think in the 70s in the U.S. It was a breakthrough 
um, that I think Vancard uh, came up with this innovative passive, passive investment model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody in the beginning was very resistant to this idea. What is this thing? You're just following the market. This is not investment. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? And then we see today that the trend has totally shifted. So now the common sense thing is that you passively invest. We talk about democratization yeah. of investment. We use all these nice terms. Mm -hmm. So we make it also have a flavor that everybody is included and everybody can have access to such investment strategies. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, slowly people picked up that, you know, you can be safer also from an institutional perspective if you, along any active investments, you also have this passive ind indices that, you know, can help you to attract perhaps a part of the population mm -hmm. that does not have so much, as, uh, so many savings to put into uh, a portfolio. So there is that, and then there is also the background of the crisis and different, you know, uh, policy developments. Yeah. So I think also one could say that regulation or government policy in general perhaps influence the rise of these indices in a yeah. way. So especially we see that in the U.S. I mean, when we talk about this issue later, it's arguable whether the situation is the same in Europe and the US. And perhaps this is also because of different policy choices or yeah. the legal background yeah. that exists in these yeah. two jurisdictions. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but what I was sort of, uh, what, I, um, what I thought is that perhaps it's beneficial for these kind of firms mm -hmm. to be really big. So for example, if you look at, yes. as at Google, it's, it's really beneficial for them to be big because so then they can- So there's scale, of course. Yeah. yeah, so is it also given the structure of these firms beneficial for them to be really big rather than to be small? Um, well, I'm not an expert in finance, but you can argue that you have economies of scale and scope also in terms of financial you know, investments mm -hmm. and holdings. So yeah, that could be an argument. Um, yeah, so from their perspective, obviously, uh, there are clear benefits yeah. of being you know, a long-term investor in all those um, uh, companies also, you know, in terms of transaction costs, information costs, they're they have a lot of expertise in yeah. this area, so they know how to do it. They have developed very wide in-house teams that engage, you know, yeah. in um, uh, with co corporate uh, with companies, you know, mm -hmm. on engagement and different yeah. corporate governance issues. So, yeah. yes, you could say there are certain benefits to the scale of yeah. the investors. Okay. Well because talking about their 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 working methods, uh, Mr. Azar, what what are the sort of the, the structures which the big investment firms use to buy all their shares? Because they they use different funds, right? They use uh, index funds, mutual funds. How are these how are these funds related uh, with each other? So um, they have both active and, and passive funds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these are all essentially mutual funds. I mean, some of them may be exchange traded and and some not. Yeah, you know it, it varies by firm. I mean, some o I, I don't know all the details of you know of all the funds that they, that they offer, but uh, they're essentially, you know, as you said, two types of funds: active funds that don't try to track an index, and index funds that will try to track an index. Yeah, yeah but um, what I mean is, if the the for example, if if Vanguard has a lot of shares in in the, uh, let's say Facebook, then these shares are part of different uh, sort of funds, right? Uh, different sort of portfolios within the company. So how do these uh, funds relate within the uh, within, for example, Vanguard? Right. So let's say Vanguard is going to offer, you know, um, an assortment of different funds that people can buy, mm -hmm. and and they they're going to have different holdings. But then in the end, the I, I guess your question is like, they also have a corporate governance. Uh, yeah. Sort of how yeah. How and, the and then the uh, the corporate governance, you know, when they interact with the firms to say, well, I may influence firm strategies. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be done at the Vanguard level, not right, not at the level of each individual far fund. Yeah. Now this is something that you know the research by Fickner, uh, Helmskirk, and, and Garcia Bernardo has shown. You know, the basically the voting of the shares uh, across the funds is essentially the same across all the Vanguard funds. Uh, it's it's not that each yeah, each so fund in Vanguard is voting their own yeah, shares. Yeah, so they they cooperate their their voting and they coordinate that. So you know, 
Yeah. You may want to invest say, in the energy sector, and maybe Vanguard will have a, an energy sector fund. Mm -hmm. And you may want, and somebody else may just want to invest in the whole Standard & Poor, and the Vanguard will have the Standard & Poor 500 fund. And so that's, I think, Vanguard's most popular fund, and I think it's the biggest mutual fund in, in the yeah. world. Um, but then in the end, you know, all the shares from all the sector funds, from the international funds, from the Standard & Poor funds, and so on, uh, they're just going to treat them um, for the purposes of governance, uh, essentially they behave as, as one unit. Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, they, so they behave as one. Yeah. All right. So the way uh, these investment firms currently uh, exist can result in a phenomenon called common ownership. So, Mr. Tanaka, could you maybe shortly tell us what what common ownership exactly mm -hmm. is? So uh, this links to the issue of cross ownership. So we need to explain. I think both and. Also explain the difference between mm -hmm. the two. Yeah. So um, economic uh, theory and research in this area um, in the 80s um, showed how you know partial holdings, partial ownership between competitors can have uh, potential competitive implications. Yeah. You know, uh, basically effects on product markets. So this is the issue of cross ownership. You have cross holdings between uh, firms that are active in the same industry. Yep. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, the phenomenon of common ownership. We start to analyze now and mm -hmm. research. Uh, in this case, you have an indirect ownership, ownership structure. So there is um, a third party financial investor you know, which is not active in the industry, uh, that has parallel holdings in two competing yeah. firms yeah. active in the same industry. Mm -hmm. So you have an indirect structure, but again, um, we try to understand whether the incentives of those competitors change because they're controlled yeah. by the same common yeah. owner. This yeah. is why we call it common ownership. Yeah. So, so that's there are overlapping shareholders there that perhaps this overlap in terms of shareholders that the two competitors share uh, may have uh, spillovers on product market competition. Yeah. Okay, and um, Mr. Azar, in one of your papers, you, you address the correlation between this uh, common ownership and a lack of competition. Um, so could you, uh, so wha wha what's the, what is the reason uh, for this, this uh, horizontal, of this common ownership resulting in uh, a lack of competition if you look, for example, to the airline industry, as you did in your research? Um, well, in so first there's the, the, you know, the theory of, of how you would think of an oligopoly industry mm -hmm. when you have cross-ownership or common ownership. You know, and there's this paper by O'Brien and, and Salop. Sorry, I couldn't. Uh, by Salop and O'Brien. Uh, 2000. 2000. Yeah. Okay. Yes. In the Antitrust Law Journal, you know, which most <laughs> economists don't know. But... Uh, um, so, and they, you know, they develop this model of oligopoly, mm -hmm. in which the firms have uh, cross ownership, and say, say I don't know if you're talking about, and so one auto company can have a cross ownership with another auto company, and how mm -hmm. that affect their incentives to compete, right? Obviously, if I'm if I'm company A and I have shares in company B, that means I don't want to, um, I if if I, for example, raise my prices and I lose market share to company B, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to get some of those profits back because I own the shares, right? And that means, well, I have um, less of a disincentive yeah. to increase prices because what is the disincentive to increase prices? Every firm, you know, would like to increase prices, but it knows that if it does yeah. it, it's going to lose some yeah. of their business to competitors, yeah. right? Well, if you have cross ownership, you're going to yeah. g uh, get that business, you know, the profits from that business anyway. And so, um, you have more of an incentive to increase prices, you know, when you're balancing that trade. Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. common ownership um, is slightly different from cross ownership, but it's basically the same story. Mm -hmm. It's saying, well, now, but, it, but it, it raises, you know, more interesting kind of theoretical questions about like, okay, what is the objective of the firm? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. with, with the cross ownership, you can still think, well, the firm still just wants to maximize its, its profits. You know, we can keep that assumption, which is, you know, a classic assumption yeah. and, and it's easy to think about. And, um, and we can just keep the profit maximization assumption. It's just that my profits now include part of the profits of the other firm directly. Uh, if you have common ownership by, say, uh, 20 shareholders, now, well, what does the firm do? 
what, it, what, what should be the objective of the firm. Now the shareholders have, uh, each of them has different portfolios, they may not agree on what they want the firm to do. So what O'Brien and Salop did was assume that the firm is going to maximize, you know, the objective is going to be a weighted average of the objectives yeah. of all the shareholders, right? So that makes it a little bit more complicated, you know, and, then, and there's a big debate about, you know, okay, is that exactly uh, the right objective, you know, for a model uh, and exactly how firms behave? And, you know, I think that's an ongoing kind of research area. Yeah. But it, it was a working assumption that they used, and, and with that, basically, but it's fairly intuitive, right? Yeah. I mean, if, you, if I'm going to now maximize some objective of my shareholders, if my shareholders have shares in my competitors as well as me, mm -hmm. well, if I'm doing what's good for my shareholders, then I'm going to take into account the profits that they get from the competitors, you yeah. know, just like in the if I help the competitors directly yeah. with the cost ownership. So, so that's basically the, the, the economics of, of yeah. common ownership and cost and ownership. And for example, if, if, if Vanguard has uh, uh, a lot of shares uh, in, in a few, few air airline companies, how, how, does, um, how do they influence the, the management of a company in, in practice? How does it work, uh, Mr. Tonati? For example, do they, yeah, do they vote against potential takeovers? Do they actively collude with each other? So this is one of the points of criticism to the research that Jose started and other economists, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So people are very obsessed about what is the co mechanism? What is the mechanism that produces those anti-competitive effects? Meaning they're asking for some kind of causal connection. What is the tool that is used, as you say, in practice? Mm -hmm. So um, Jose and other authors argue that, you know, it's uh, it could be corporate governance mechanism, like what we would usually think as a good thing, you know, engagement yeah. of shareholders. It could be voting, as you said. Uh, in one of the papers of Jose, he talks about voting for uh, managers, you know, for um, uh, board yeah. representation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the investors can choose who they want to promote and uh, on the board or uh, who actually to disqualify. So there are different ways, and also there are other ways beyond corporate governance, like communications, engagement, uh, not only through formal means, but also informal means. For example, if, um, an institutional investor, someone from, I don't know, BlackRock, pick up the phone, mm -hmm. calls the CEO of a big company in the IT sector, mm -hmm. and says, well, you know, you think, I don't think this is the right strategy. Yeah. Maybe we should think about that. And this is a form of communication that it's a bit informal, mm -hmm. but, you know, companies perhaps and investors do it all the time, but from a competition antitrust perspective where I look this issues from, it could be quite problematic because we don't want that competing companies have information mm -hmm. about the yeah. strategies of other companies. So if you have the same common investor, the same common owner, mm -hmm. then things can get a little bit, you know, gray yeah. <laughs> in how you stand in this. But what do the other shareholders in that company think of uh, these big institutional investors? Because they want to, I think, heavily compete with the, with the other. How, how is the relation between? I think it depends. So um, in connection to what Jose said, um, it is the, the common ownership scenario is quite mm -hmm. complex because it is not just one scenario. You have to really uh, break down in different scenarios, look at the specific facts of the case, what is the corporate governance structure of the company, what is the ownership structure, yeah. how is control divided, uh, what kind of rights other shareholders have, uh, and are they really engaged? Are they active in terms of corporate governance or are they yeah. really don't care? Perhaps they own those shares, but they never appear in uh, shareholder meetings or they never vote their yeah. shares. So it really differs per Exactly. Situation. So yeah. I think it really depends. The other, the other thing is that these institutional investors, I mean, if we talk, talk about common ownership of institutional investors, is that they are long-term investors. So not only they are common owners, mm -hmm. but the companies who are owned by them, they know that they will be there for a very long time, yeah. you know? And they are the shareholders that they cannot easily get rid of. 
yeah. in a sense. So <laughs> this also adds to potential anti-competitive incentives in yeah. that sense, you know, yeah. and managers perhaps will uh, take into account the positions of those long-term investors more compared to some other, yeah. you know, private, yeah. small yeah. investor okay. in the capital market. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then we can return to the audience maybe. For I is there someone who has a question to either Mr. Azar or Mrs. Zanati? Yeah? You, you get a microphone, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. This is very interesting for me because my thesis was on uh, the comparative study of uh, the US, uh, the mortgage crisis, and the a Southeast Asian crisis. And I like literally, you know, what the advice is and like standard and post. Anyway, to the point, but so <laughs> what they are saying is they're actually following the rules now, right? They're kind of like taking back and they're being less risky and everything. I understand the uh, uh, competitive impl implications and everything. And of course, it's really scary because as it is, Google and Facebook are already taking over the world and now BlackRock apparently is taking over the world as well. Um, my question is like, where do you draw the line? I mean, if they don't follow the rules, they're damned. But if they follow the rules, they're damned as well. So, I mean, uh, it, I mean, we are trying to be moderate in everything. So they're being moderate. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, you have the answers, of course. So, so should I answer? Yeah. yeah you so I, uh, that's a great question, and and that's basically like uh, very similar to you know what I was arguing in in my thesis. I mean, I. W Basically, uh, what I was saying is there, there's a trilemma. You know, there's three objectives that basically different branches of economic theory uh, and of uh, our institutions kind of prioritize, and those objectives are incompatible. I mean, the first one is, so that I think that's what I mean by they're following the rules. You know, but you're saying if they follow the rules here, you know, on this side, they can't follow the rules on the other one. So what, you know, but this is why it's a trilemma. And basically, the trilemma is, you can't have at the same time portfolio diversification you know, completely because then all the companies have the same owners. Uh, shareholder value maximization and what people would call good governance, you know, having the, the managers act in the interest of the shareholders and competition because if you have perfect diversification and everybody holds a market portfolio, you get a, you know, a monopoly of the whole economy. Mm -hmm. Then if you have good governance, now the, the managers of the firms are going to basically actually implement those monopolistic incentives, and then you have no competition anymore. You know, you have all the firms are essentially one big firm, uh, you know, kind of like a super organism. And so, I mean, and, and I think what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, it's like, if they follow the rules, right, of, well, w what should we do? We should diversify portfolios, you know, we should act in the interest of our clients, and then we should have the companies that, that we own act in the interest of the shareholders. Um, we have a problem on their side. So it's, it's a systemic problem, and it's not clear how to, in the end, yes. uh, balance these objectives. And, and that's why it's interesting. I mean, from a policy point of view. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And actually, we were already planning on talking a bit about that, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, OK, so we were talking about the, uh, a bit about the airline industry and about the lack of competition, uh, for example, there. And in uh, Mr. Azar, you show in your paper that in the case there, it, sh it, lead, uh, it led to higher prices in, in the airline industry. Does a lack of competition always lead to higher prices? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, <laughs> so I would say no. The, mm -hmm. the answer is, uh, I wouldn't say that's a general thing. And in a way, I'm, I'm working on a paper now o on like good things from common ownership. So here's the thing, I mean, monopoly, you know, I w you know, our antitrust culture kind of know, says, well, this is a problematic thing and, and we need to have regulations for monopoly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, monopoly has, you know, good things about it. I mean, it makes companies, for example, maybe more able to think long term. Exactly. And, yeah. and there, you know, Schumpeter, you know, was saying, well, we, you need some monopoly profits to, to innovate. And, um, and, and also, in mono you know, if you have many companies, it leads you to internalize externalities um, such as, for example, you know, pollution yeah. and, uh, and, um, and, and other things, you know. So in the end, um, having sometimes having more monopoly can be good. Now, at the same time, it sounds like having all the companies, you know, 
in all the publicly traded companies in the US and, and you know more and more also in the world, but in yeah. Europe it is, is less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having say you know this th this big three have twenty percent of of the ownership. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it seems like it would create significant antitrust risk, and that that is uh, dangerous. Yeah. Um, so we need to think about what that implies. You know, but at the same time, there will also be positive aspects. Yeah. And um, uh, and I think that BlackRock uh, is emphasizing, you know, some of the positive aspects. And for example, it's uh, you know asking firms to um, to say, you know, well, uh, more about what are their CO two emissions uh, and so on. Yeah, because um. actually that, that's that's funny that you talk about that. that because Bill Mc McNabb, the chairman of Vanguard, he recently urged CEOs of, of big companies to think more long term. And um, he, he said, and I quote, for too long, companies have sacrificed long term value creation to generate short term results. So, yeah, so actually it could also be a good a good of good influence to these mm -hmm. um, to these kind of companies. But. Another thing is that um, if they r if they uh, if they rise the or higher the prices, then it is only a good thing if they invest that extra money into research and development, right? So mm -hmm. the question is, are they are they actually doing that? The companies. Do you well, I would say if they invest their extra money in research and development, or at least if they pass on the, the you know the the extra prices to workers as as wages, right? I mean, I think that in the end. Um, you know, we did our uh, empirical papers on um, on airlines and, in and and banking because we had good data. But that doesn't mean that that what we were really thinking about was airlines. You know, and, and uh, what I th would mm -hmm. say is the main concern. I mean, I think in the end we have to think about the labor share, and w you know, there's the you know a very old theory of the distribution of income between workers and uh, investors, um, but. Uh, by Michal Kaletsky, you mm -hmm. know, the, the Polish economist, and mm -hmm. basically his theory was, wha was, well, the more monopoly power you have, the lower the labor share is going to be, because um, you're going to create a markup between what you're charging consumers and your pa what you're paying the workers. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, and I think that's what we need to be thinking more about, you know. Uh, so, you know, the airline thing is just like a, a test of the theory. It's a, it's a natural laboratory to see, well, are they internalizing and are these people and, and these funds mm -hmm actually having any effect and, no. and but, yeah. I, but in the end you know the broader things mm -hmm. uh, are what matters and another of another example of of how these big investment firms could maybe have a good contribution to the world is recently blackrock changed uh, some of their funds and they excluded companies which uh, uh, produced guns um, from their from their portfolios because there was some pressure put put on put on them from society. So, Mr. Tanaki, isn't uh, the the size of these these investment firms doesn't make that it that easy for us as society to use them as a as a vehicle to uh, to achieve change? Hmm. Well, you can always find useful vehicles. The <laughs> thing is, when they get out of control, what are you going to do? You know, there's a price to everything, this is what I'm going to mm -hmm. say. And yeah. I mean, in the current model of agency capitalism that we have, that I mean, from a finance and corporate government perspective, we try to analyze the cost and, you know, we have the basic, the basic uh, corporate governance models when you have dispersed ownership and then, you know, you try, you know, the basic agency cost is between managers and shareholders. Mm -hmm. Now this story changes because we have an additional set of agency costs. So we have the record holders and we have also the beneficial owners, which are the savers, the ones who invest in that funds. And then you have yeah. the institutional investors who run the funds and everything. So again, as we discuss about the common ownership idea from a competition perspective, the analysis get a bit complicated. You know, how this incent the incentives play out in these layers of agency costs and who is doing what on whose behalf. Okay? Yeah. So what are we trying to do in the end? So I'm not sure we are hundred percent sure. And I mean there is a very good rhetoric and as as uh, Jose said, for sure this company is also um, have benefits to offer, but we should be aware of the trade-offs. 
And this is what we are trying to do, I think, in our research to highlight perhaps what's our trade-offs, and it's not our job to decide how these trade-offs perhaps need to be shaped, politicians or policymakers to decide that question, but our job perhaps is to highlight those trade-offs, you know, from a legal and economic yeah. perspective. Yeah. Okay, because they also heavily uh, democratize the... the um but what does it mean, democratize? I mean that that <laughs> that that it is uh, available <laughs> for the ev everyday investor. And who is the everyday investor? Do all U.S. citizens have uh, investments? In Sorry. Those? Do I mean uh, just there is a question whether there is an overlap between savers, the people who invest in those funds, the beneficial owners, as I said, and those who are either you know consumers or workers, as was said. And I don't think there is a complete overlap between these three groups. So if Why we not? assume, because not all U.S. citizens, for example, if we talk about the problem in the mm -hmm. U.S. context, are have savings in those funds. They don't have investments in those funds, right? Yeah, not everybody, of course. But yeah, so they could not have, right? It's not full democratization. So it's no, but they could. They are. They they have the possibility to to do it, right? Yes, but of course, not everybody chooses to do so. Well, there's also the question of, of price. Oh, then there's yeah. also the question. I mean, some people mm -hmm. just don't have any investments at all. You know, th basically, I think yeah. the bottom half of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. don't have any access. any stocks at all through yeah. mutual funds or, or otherwise. Yeah, but is that because they and don't have access or because they don't do well it? Well, they have access. It's just they don't have money. enough money to invest. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> but that's a different problem. <laughs> but well, it's the but same but thing this is the problem. in competition um. a lot. You know, if the price is too high, some consumers will not buy. Of course, they have access, but they don't have the money. So it's the same analysis. Uh, there, there was an <laughs> a recent <laughs> study by um, Ed Walls of on the distribution of wealth mm -hmm. in the U.S. And I think it showed something that, like, I think the top 1% of the wealth distribution holds something like more than 40% of all stocks, including through mutual funds yeah. and retirement accounts. Yeah. So, you know, stock ownership I is very concentrated, mm. right? And so that even, even if, if someone, you know, that has, I don't know, $1,000 to invest can buy an index fund, that doesn't mean that they're going to get the same influence on, on BlackRock's corporate governance as a sovereign wealth fund, maybe, or, or something like that, that is managing you know, billions, right? Yeah. So in the end, I I think that calling this democratic seems a bit... Um, Distortive? Distortive, a bit weird. I mean, but people talk, about let's say. people talk about shareholder democracy, you know, and, and they say, well, one share, one vote is shareholder democracy, but what are shares? They're a form of wealth, right? What do we call a, an e a political system mm -hmm. where, like, your representation is proportional to your wealth? I yeah. mean, it's not democracy, right? I yeah. think it's, <laughs> it's a Greek... Word, <laughs> 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 um, it's called plutocracy, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, you know, you have to understand. I think when you, it's correct to talk about democratization, and certainly there were more people who had access because the fees dropped massively mm -hmm. when you had this possibility of passive investment yeah. strategy. Of course. But at the same time, it's not that the whole population could still have access to that. Still, it was an expensive sport, yeah. let's say. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah we I need understand. to understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to end this discussion about whether these, these <laughs> investment firms are good or bad, um, the, uh, the famous economist Richard, Richard Thaler once, once said, and I quote, given that, uh, that these investment firms have grown so big because their fees are so small, these are the kinds of kind of mon monopolies that don't keep me up at night. So, so Ta Thaler doesn't really see them as a problem. So, Mr. Azar, wha what does Thaler uh, <laughs> miss <laughs> in his reasoning, according to you? Well, I mean, I think it's um, it's very misleading what he's uh, what he's saying because he's mm -hmm. saying, oh, they their fees are low, yeah. right? Mm. But that's not the market that we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're this he's talking about the market and he's focusing the discussion. If you if you will, maybe he's framing it, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> in a way so that we're focused on the on the market for mutual funds, mm -hmm. and they're saying, oh well, they're introducing competition in the market for mutual funds, but you know these firms interact in many other markets, and and what we're really talking about is the labor market, you know, the airlines, yeah. uh, uh, tickets market, the the, the market, the banking yeah. market, and so on, and he doesn't say anything about that, you know, yeah. so these are not the m maybe they don't keep him up at night for whatever <laughs> reason. 
but I think they should keep us up at night and we should think hard yeah. about you know what are the pros and cons of this and, and how do we deal with this you know this is a huge change in the structure of our economy mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's you know it's a systemic issue and it raises important questions and you know the you know the research we're doing is is early I mean to really call it but I think that saying you know that oh, okay it, it it gives you low fees and therefore it yeah. can't be a problem seems um yeah wrong so, so he yeah <laughs> so not <laughs> wrong but perhaps it's one sided so from the finance perspective it's mm -hmm. clear that there are benefits to the strategies yeah. what we perhaps were missing all this time it's you know this other side this perhaps unintended consequences that come with this good thing that you know we have lower fees more access to investment and savings and so on mm -hmm. so that is all good but perhaps we need to understand more and have a more transparent and more clear view of what is the really the price society is paying yeah. for those low fees and this yeah. is what we're trying to do i think yeah yeah so it's reading about yes, exactly. weighting the different yes. yeah okay so before we dive into the regulation part is there somebody from the audience who has another question on the back there yeah um, I wanted to uh, link the fact that the these organizations are mon uh, m monopolies, are acting as monopolies, and the fact that their nature is plutocratic and anti-democratic. So the main argument against nas nationalization was that uh, it was acting as a monopoly and the incentives would be different from a uh, market uh, co uh, competitive economy. So what is your opinion on the nationalization of such um, sectors of the economy that are acting in a <coughs> monopolistic manner? You mean nationalizing BlackRock? Yeah. Uh, but by which nation? <laughs> <laughs> by the US? I didn't, I didn't think of that. I was putting the question forward. Um, so you want to answer that? Well, I think as uh, rightly highlighted, the political, you know, aspects of that, you know, um, issue, you know, we also have international trade and we cannot agree how we coordinate all these aspects. So I think practically and politically, it's a very difficult, if not impossible, task to do. So hence, you know, the current regime. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, according to Bloomberg, the total value of assets under management of these big investment firms is only going to rise and more in, in the future. So um, do you think this is true, that, that it will only get bigger and bigger? Seems reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, terms. it seems. I mean, uh, you know, passive investment is grow outgrown uh, active. If there is no regulation, it will grow more. Seems natural. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, terms. so if th if they if they only will grow in the future, and if they clearly have some, yeah, maybe not not really nice uh, effects on 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 uh, on society, for example, on prices. It seems that that a solution has to be maybe found. So maybe there has to come regulation. So, um, or not, or not. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think is is the best to use, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Tanaki, to use an old law, for example, uh, the the Clayton Act in America, or one of the other old uh, antitrust laws, or or to enact a new law to sort of specifically uh, regulate uh, these companies? I think specific laws is not a very good idea. I mean, mm -hmm. we already have laws that are adjustable. You mentioned the uh, we have merger control in Europe and the US and the basic antitrust provisions. So I think with the right enforcement of those rules, you know, uh, Professor Elhog is arguing about that and mm -hmm. other prominent scholars mm -hmm. in this area, um, the issues that arise from common ownership can already be tackled. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel, in a and way. And then you mean by the Clayton Act? Or yeah, yeah, so we just need to enforce the law. I mean, there's a huge debate if we should uh, really enforce the law in this area where mm -hmm. it's still it's like there's an open debate about the extent of the problem and so on. And perhaps by trying to address a problem, you create more problems in uh, capital markets and so on. So uh, I think... Um, 
Uh, I think uh, if you look at the issue in terms of competitive implications, I think we do have some tools, and definitely more, to more antitrust tools uh, exist in the US uh, than in Europe, that the structure of the rules is such that, you know, um, certain, let's say, legal limitations exist in the design of the yeah. rules that perhaps we cannot address all cases uh, of anti-competitive investment, but I think if there is a will, there is a way. Yeah. So if the commission decides, and there is discussion about this, there are ongoing consultations in this area, uh, so perhaps uh, there, there are ways to do that without just creating a law specifically for common ownership, let's say. Okay, so yeah, so you would rather I use mean the old already existing... I mean, at least this is what I'm arguing in my dissertation, yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. as a law and economic scholar, mm -hmm. I'm not very in favor of specific regulation. Okay, but yeah. and Mr. Azar, what do you think of, of this? Uh, well, we need a new law, or... Yeah, well, yeah, I if we need regulation, should we then enact a new law, or should we use already existing laws, if you look, for example, to America? So, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I read El Hall's uh, paper, and he says, you know, the the existing laws, at least in the US, would be enough. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there needs to be new jurisprudence uh, or new cases, uh, because, you know, recently there was this other paper, you know, like a couple of days ago, so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know all the details of this, mm -hmm. by Judge Ginsburg, who's, you know, a famous antitrust judge, mm -hmm. um, um, more from the, age, you know, he's in George Mason University, you know, yeah. so he's, uh, you know, against El Hogg. And, and he says, well, essentially, El Hogg is arguing for a literal interpretation of the law, and he criticizes him for that. Okay. Um, so he's saying El Hogg is taking the law to, lit to literature, but basically what the law says, apparently, is already enough. It says that there were later cases with the Chicago School that uh, kind of watered down the antitrust laws. Yeah. And, you know, now many people are, are talking about that and saying, well, we maybe we need to take a step back. Yeah. But essentially, I mean, it's important to underline that the basic difference under merger control in the U.S. is that there is no safe harbor or minimum threshold for liability if there are anti-competitive effects. So basically, it's an effects test. So as long as you have anti-competitive effects, I mean, there is an issue of proof. Mm -hmm. How you actually prove those effects. But in theory, the law allows you to go after cases that produce harmful effects as the empirical papers of Fosse and other people show. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, Professor Alfog is ar arguing for basically an implementation of the law we have yeah. and nothing more. I mean, it is a matter of uh, enforcement and, you know, um, prioritization of, ca of those cases as opposed to other cases that, you know, are on the antitrust agenda of policymakers or enforcers in the U.S. and yeah. the EU. In the EU, the situation is a little bit different. Yeah, because, because what are the main differences between the EU and so the U.S.? So, in terms of merger control, um, in the U.S., as I said, uh, both um, the jurisdictional criteria, like when merger control can be triggered, and also in terms of substantive analysis, when you look actually at the effects of a merger mm -hmm. or a partial acquisition in the case of this uh, uh, common holdings, um, you, don't need, um, you don't need to show that you acquire control. So as a common owner, you don't need to have control. You can just have influence or some kind of anti-competitive effect by other means. So basically, U.S. merger control is more open-ended. It allows you for more possibilities yeah, to right. show the effects. In Europe, jurisdiction depends on a test of control. So if you have a non-controlling holding, you can be safe that you escape merger control scrutiny. And there is, as I said, there are consultations in Europe whether we should change those thresholds, whether we should make yeah. it lower. And it's not a theoretical debate because... For example, the UK or Germany do have lower thresholds. Yeah. In Germany, there is a um, um, competitively significant influence test, and in the UK, material influence test. I mean, I know this is all legalese. Um, in the EU, the test is control, meaning decisive influence. So you need to be able to decide either uh, in terms of positive or negative control, meaning by veto rights. Um, so the bottom line is that if you can influence the, uh, the company without having explicit control, yeah. 
these, ca these situations can also be captured. And when we have these small holdings and parallel holdings by many institutional investors, perhaps we do have product market distortions without reaching a level of control. So perhaps there are some problematic cases that we cannot address right now from a merger control perspective. Now, as I said, be beyond merger control, we al also have antitrust rules. So these are rules that are enshrined in the treaty, yeah. the European yeah. treaties. Mm -hmm. So they talk about anti-competitive agreements and abuse of dominance. But then we have some legal hard rules we need to overcome in order to, imp to impose those rules in a situation of a common ownership. For example, uh, in order to, you need to prove anti-competitive agreement. Basically, you need to prove that there was a legal agreement or at least yeah. some communication, some information exchange between you know, um, the investors and the uh, companies owned by yeah. that investor. So from a legal perspective, in terms of proof, as I said before, it's much more difficult. Yeah, On the other hand, for abuse, you need to prove that you had dominance, you had dominant mm -hmm. position. So it is a little bit more complicated, you know? Yeah, but, so but, but if we want to actually use that law and regulate the institutional investment firms, what should the goal then be? Should we, uh, should we force them to break up or should we limit their their uh, holdings of a of a specific industry to to uh, to one percent of the of the total value of your industry what wha what do you think is the best thing to do mr Azar? um i don't know what's the best thing to do i mean i think one i mean the first step should be um <coughs> being aware of what's the problem uh, and measuring mm -hmm. you know using these modified indices it's also more transparency um, to what uh, well so first you know, first we need to understand the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to, you know, measure what is the degree of concentration in the economy that's coming from common ownership. Yeah, so we're doing that right now, right? So, so, we we so we're doing that, we're working on that. And, I I I I and other people are working on that. And, and I hope that the antitrust agencies, you know, take a look uh, from their perspective and mm -hmm. then they will decide what they think. And, and in the end, you know, it's complicated because many people hold these funds and so it's not so easy to break them up, yeah. Um, but it can be done. It yeah, it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and what, what do you think, Mrs. Sanaki? Uh, I you mean, think the, the issue of remedy is uh, quite important, and I mean, we don't only need to specify the parameters of the problem, how big is the problem, in theoretical or empirical terms. We need to understand if we can actually do something about the problem. So that we come. Mm -hmm the discussion about remedies and I think we cannot think about remedies on a blanket base like across the board basically I think we need to understand also you know in the specific industry in the specific case what how does the market look yeah. like how again the the institutional investment ownership looks like in yeah. that industry uh, what are the corporate governance you know structures or ownership structures so I think the details matter, and this is why it makes this problem very interesting, yeah. but also very complicated. Yeah, so you would and propose you different pin measures it down for different... Uh, yes, I mean, there is this proposal by Posner, Weil, and others that, as you say, suggests that there mm -hmm. is some time of a safe harbor, so perhaps we don't want you know, to eliminate this investment uh, index fund model mm -hmm. altogether. So perhaps an option could be for those funds to avoid liability by minimizing their investments, either by investing only in one firm per industry, yeah. so no diversification yeah, within the same industry. Yeah. So, so they no can't, competition. For example, invest yes. in Facebook and Google at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Although that could be an issue yeah, because, because the market definition yeah, is okay. another discussion. Yeah. Uh, but uh, okay, so this is one possibility that they suggest, or. The other possibility that I suggest is that you know you limit ownership to one percent of all firms yeah, in the, the total industry. value of the industry. But then there is criticism and other papers that came back and said no, it should be fifteen percent. I mean, yeah. how do you come up with a number? This is a whole other discussion. So I think, as Hossa said, it's very early stages. Yeah. We really need to understand more the parameters of the problem mm -hmm. and what we are really trying to achieve here. So. And then yeah. perhaps we can find solutions. Yeah, because it, but if if you would limit, for example, their their um, their investments to a total share of one percent of the of the of the, of the mm -hmm. total industry, that they can't also really be index funds anymore, right? Because then 
then they can't track the markets anymore properly. So Indeed. then there will be really heavy. So this is another I criticism of that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, counter literature, let's yeah. say, to uh, the literature that raises this problem that, you know, it will be, you know, a destruction, a complete destruction of the index fund model, yeah. uh, this passive investment model from a finance perspective. Yeah. So I mean, it's much easier for an antitrust agency to just deal with a merger, you know, where they can say, well, do we allow these two firms to combine or yeah. not, and that's yeah. it, and that's a simple decision. Oh well, yeah. there's you know there may be very complex economics involved, but I in the end, you know, uh, either they let them merge or not. And so, from from a policy point of view, it's much simpler. But here, you know, the shares are being traded all the time, and as people buy the funds, they uh, you know the, the shares are added to BlackRock's and Vanguard's portfolios, and then at the same time, they're they are, are also creating all these benefits, you know, of low fees that you were pointing out, and in the end, at the same time, if you know, we're looking at airlines, and and by the way, we're not looking at BlackRock or Vanguard, you know, in particular, we're looking at all the common ownership together. Yeah. You know, BlackRock and Vanguard just happen to be the, the largest asset managers, mm -hmm. and that's why there's a focus on them. But then, common ownership of the whole economy is a much more complicated thing than common ownership of airlines, and so to understand that is, you know, requires much more work. That uh, and and. I'm working on a paper on, on what, what it means, you know, wh how is common ownership of a whole economy different from common ownership of an industry? Yeah. And it's, uh, um, you know, I'm just doing like a, a small step towards that in, in yeah. making a paper, I hope, you know, it's out soon, um, but we're almost done. It's a paper I'm working on with Xavier Vives. Okay, and so that's, and so it's a theory, exciting. it's a theory paper. Um okay. I think it will be exciting. Okay, that's, that's, that's <laughs> really cool. For people who like theory. <laughs> 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 Actually, <laughs> I want to, <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> Actually I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, how do you understand what are the effects of owning all the companies in the economy? Yes, I mean, you really have it's, to it's, it's, it's almost like yeah. you would have to be a central planner to understand that. And yeah. so it's it's going to be very hard to pin down what are the implications of all this. It's yeah, just so like these are detailed problems and the solution should also be sort of uh, detailed. So actually one more thing about the theory before we, before we, before we end. The, um, you already mentioned sort of the, the, tri the trilemma you uh, proposed, so you can't really have um, uh, diversification, shareholder representation, and competition at the same time. But do you, do you think we should perhaps change our financial theory? Because our financial theory currently leads to uh, portfolio diversification being the most lucrative, and that results in these investment firms being so big, and that results in common ownership, which results in, in higher prices. So should we perhaps change our financial models to counter this? Well, I think we need to, um, so here's the thing. I mean, the, m the current uh, financial uh, economics paradigm is based on a model that either treats the, the firms as just like, a, you know, like a tree that gives you apples mm -hmm. or, uh, or as a perfectly competitive firm. So it assumes that the pr firms are price takers. Yeah. But then the theory ends up contradicting itself because yeah. um, in the model, everybody's going to hold a, a diversified portfolio, and actually, this takes away the foundation for its own assumption. Because if everybody holds yeah. a diversified portfolio, as we said, all the firms are the same owners, and don't, and so they wouldn't act, they wouldn't actually be price takers. Yeah. In that case, they would be like a monopoly. Um, but the the current models, so at least the ones that have production you know, and firms uh, uh, that are explicitly models, you know, they're contradicting themselves. So that's something that should be um, changed, you know, and and they would have to. And and well, and if you did that, then you you would understand that the implication is anti-competitive. But they they couldn't see that because they were the models that recommended diversification. They were just assuming that firms were perfectly competitive. Yeah. So that okay. I think yeah. that's part of you know this kind mm -hmm. of like compartmentalization yeah. in mm -hmm. economics that led to well people saying well we should diversify our portfolios based on this simple theory yeah. where monopoly can never happen by assumption. Yeah. So we're in sort um, of in a circle. And uh, and and by the way, you know, you mentioned Thaler, you know, mm -hmm. and he. The interesting thing about this, you know, these are like the, the classical uh, finance theories and, the, you know, the efficient market hypothesis is related to this paradigm and so on. And then the people who criticize this paradigm are people like, like Thaler that say, yeah. say, well, why aren't people diversifying their portfolios enough? You know, the I rational people should diversify their portfolios and so we need to nudge people to hold index funds yeah. and so on. And Thaler has papers, you know, saying like, well, you know, we don't understand why, you know, these, these workers at these firms are, are holding like employee stock ownership programs and they're trying to be the owners of their own firms 
instead of doing what they should do according to economic theory yeah. you know, so they're being irrational and we don't we don't get it you know they like why are they trying to own their own firms yeah. you know in 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 in, in, in failures model like Tristan is perfectly competitive in the labor market and and you know the wage is equal to the marginal product no matter what they do so they should just hold the diverse side portfolio yeah. but you know he's seeing this as evidence of irrationality but it may be that he's just uh, using a, an, a simplistic model with no market power and then what the workers are doing is you know has a, a, a good rationale which is that they want to own their own firm so they don't extract one of rents from themselves yeah. now there's a trade-off which is they lose diversification so if their company goes bankrupt now they lose not only their job, but but also all, all their savings. So yeah, so there is a real trade-off. There are some but interesting. But uh, is not considering that trade-off. Yeah, you know, he's just saying, well, people are irrational because my simplistic economic theory, you know, can't explain what's going on in reality, and so mm -hmm. we need to nudge people towards holding the market. You know, like the neoclassical finance theory. So, so this yeah. is something that the behaviorals and the neoclassicals, in the end, in the policy recommendation, they just say they both ignore, ignore the problem. You know, they're just both saying, well, everyone should hold the index. You know, they agree. In the yeah. end, for practical purposes, yeah. um, but uh, but antitrust, you know, and, and I/O, then those people will disagree with them, with both of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we end, I wanted to say to the to the audience that next week we have a very interesting um, interview with uh, Ingrid van Engelshoven, the Minister of Education. So make sure you attend that interview. And then, for now, I want to thank you very much for uh, for this interesting interview. Thank you. All right. Thank you.